So I had trouble walking, the talking, and everything else that's in life. I've been through a lot in the last couple of weeks. You know, <coughs> you get to the point you may not make it. You know, this may be the end. You may never be able to go to church again. You may never be able to come back and thank your friends for the cards and letters and all the prayers that you did, you know, for me. But it is the only thing that brought me through. Praise the Lord. Yeah. You get so low, you get so a certain place, you just can't do anything for yourself. You know, you're depending upon the God to bring you through. And that's, that's what we're going to try to sing about today. I need thee every hour. so much. He's glad to be up moving around. I am so sure. Um, to get praying for him. Psalm chapter 113. Here's your rear verses of the minutes 4 through 9. We're talking, doing a series called Summer of Praise. And we're talking about worshiping and praising the Lord. So we come to a part today. Why praise Him? On the back of your bulletins, if you got bulletins, Diane's hanging them up this morning. If you got bulletins, you can fill in the notes here for your visitors. We'll have lines up there and you can fill that in. 
So the question is, why praise the Lord? We have a lot of other things that can occupy our mind in this world. There are all kinds of things that can occupy our mind in this world. Um, there are things we want to do. How many do things sometimes you don't want to do? Raise your hand if you do things sometimes you don't want to do. Sometimes you have to do that. As children grow up, they find out there's things they don't want to do. But once it's done, they may learn from it. One of the biggest lessons I had, I told my grandsons, we had Gabe and Connor, and I was 11, and we lived in, in, in Ohio, and I had two paper routes. I said, you guys need to take more responsibility, help your parents. Well, this is really sick, you all know that. And Ryan works and tries to do everything else. And I got up at 6 o'clock every morning, they threw the newspapers on the front porch, and cook, and that woke me up. I went before school, delivered papers. Had another company after school deliver those papers. I did that for a year. The first, the one after school was one I had first, and then uh, the one in the morning after it came to get started getting cold. I wanted to quit and give it to somebody else. And my stepdad put, she said, "You're not going to quit." He said, "You took on the responsibility." He said, "Nobody else wants to be out there in the winter time." I mean, I, I was. It was a seven day a week, thirty day, thirty one day a month job. Twice a day, I made a whole $42, $40 a month. I mean, I got rich off of that. Put a bike and layaway on Western Auto. How many remember Western Auto? A lot of hands coming up. $45, my first bike. I had $12 left or something like that. But said, I'll front you the rest of it if you want to get it out. And so you can ride your bike. And that made it a lot easier. It was a lot faster delivering papers before school and after school on a bicycle than walking. But he made me do it. He said, you're going to stick with it whether you like it or not. Did I like it? I did not. Was I allowed to complain about it? Were you allowed to complain to your parents about things you didn't do? I stuck with it. I spent all that money, you know, all that $40 a month. Um, but it taught me a lesson. you got to stick with something. If you're going to do it, stick with it. So we do things we don't want to. So we're going to talk about why we should praise the Lord. <laughs> Um, Psalm 113 uh, just read 4 through 6 if you will Carrie the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth so a good question why number one because of his glory we should praise him now the world has all kinds of things that they call their little g-o-d-s, gods. Their yards, their homes, their cars. If I had the money, if I had a... i, I got to buy a lottery ticket to win first, I think. you got to buy it first. But if I did, the first things I'd do is get me a 57 Chevy. Just to look at it. I've always wanted a 57 Chevy. I told Jim one that a few years ago. So I've got a wooden one on my desk. He came in a couple weeks later and had a 57 Chevy. Gates broke the vinyl top, the top off of it. So, it's a, so it's a, it's a, it doesn't have a top on it. So it's open air. Uh, there are all kinds of things. There are all kinds of things that we can, that people worship. Their own selves. Um, we were given a whole bunch of stuff this week. Last Sunday, Frances said she lives in a trailer court in the west side of town. A lot of you have been over there. Uh, a man died, and the people on the city have, they had a couple days to get everything out of there. So my wife and I went and loaded a truckload last Sunday. My truck, you know how big my truck is, truck full. The boys went with us on Monday, and Ryan, we had another truck. I borrowed Larry's trailer. We had another truck and trailer, full. This man used to be a preacher, but he must have liked to look at himself. I don't know how many mirrors were in that house. Am I right, Francis? Mirrors everywhere. He must have liked, he must have walked up, so I am looking good. I don't know. Maybe he needed to fix his hair, whatever. And two or three tables and chairs. And that man had a shed full of flower, artificial flowers. He did flower arrangements. And he had skeins and skeins and skeins and skeins of yarn. I think those were his wife's, though. She had already passed away. 
We can find all kinds of things to keep our minds and to worship in this world. So why should we praise God? We say He's His glory. It is going to be wonderful, at least for me, I hope it is for you. Um, it's going to be wonderful to see His throne. The one slide, did you see the one slide I have there? I found out this week a girl I went to college with and she was from the St. Louis area. She had a picture and they said that they had a drawing of how the camps around the tabernacle, how they camp. Did everybody see that? Did anybody notice something on that? Anybody? No? Yes. What? It is exactly. When you took an aerial view of it, it looked like a cross. A precursor to the Lord Jesus Christ. The glory of God. So, he is exalted, number one. God is greater than all the glory of all the nations. This world is a glorious place. Jim and Ann, you've been to, have you been to all 48 states? You continue to contiguous states? If Jim could figure out how to do pontoons on a truck, he'd go to Hawaii, because Ann won't fly. So if he could figure that out, but she, have you been to Alaska? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah, have you been to Alaska? I didn't think so. They, but they've been to all other 48 states. Do what? Canada and Mexico. Canada and Mexico. Uh, he worked on Mexico. But they, all 48 states, too short. Now, Fran's been to Hawaii twice. That's a little farther away. I've been to a lot of the states. The grandkids were asked the other day. You've been to this state, you've been to this state. And, and the biggest one I've ever been to the most, the biggest state I've ever been to is the state of confusion. Um, how many of you have been there? Uh, but I've been all over, and this, this country is beautiful. We've taken back roads. We don't always stay on the highway. The desert in New Mexico is ex ex it's spectacular. If you ever get a chance to go west, drive through New Mexico and Arizona, the desert is spectacular. No, it's not just sand. It's beautiful. There's mountains and there's rocks and there's plants and there's all kinds of things. It's a beautiful place. But nothing's more glorious than God. He is greater, as you know, than all the glories of heaven. Who created it? He did. When the nations are gone and this earth is gone, he's going to create new ones, yes. But his praises will be heard in heaven and all through the galaxy. When he makes a new one, He's going to get rid of this heaven and earth. One of these days it's going to be destroyed. So it says he is exalted. Verse number 5 says he is exceptional. There's no one like him. Um, there's none that can be even compared, like Dr. S. M. Lockridge, black preacher from San Diego. He went through this high heart and preached three times a person, heard the tapes. Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge. He went through this whole spiel. If you don't, if you don't like, if you can't afford metal, there's plastic. If you can't afford vinyl, there. You know, if you can't afford leather, there's cloth. He went through this whole thing. If you can't afford wood, there's veneer. He went through this whole thing. If you know, if you can't have this, you can have this. If you can't have this, you can have this. One's nice. One will make. One will do, but it's not as nice. But at the end, he said, "There's nobody like him. There's nobody like him." By Jesus, he said, there's nobody like him. He said, you can't compare. There's no plastic Jesus. There's no wood Jesus. There's no fake one. He said, there's nobody like him. He's exceptional. One day, all other false deities and, and, and exalted persons, whoever they are, the Bible says they're going to be a, not even a memory because every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's my God. He's exceptional. He's also extraordinary. <coughs> it's amazing that a God like ours, now think about it, would even consider to condescend out of heaven his son come and be like us, die on a cross, be smitten, punished, beaten, died, but it wasn't for himself. Who was it for? 
for every one of us. Now, you take every other false god in the world, the G-O-D, the little G, and they always want something. They, you have to take them something. You have to bring an offering. You have to crawl to them. They're wooden gods or hay or stubble or gold. You have to go to them and you've got to provide sacrifices to them. But our God says you don't have to provide a sacrifice to me. I'm going to provide my son to sacrifice for you so you can come and be with me. Is that a difference? Of course it is. Why praise him? He's extraordinary. There's nobody like him. Secondly, because of his grace. Praise him. Psalm chapter 113, verse 7 says, He raises up the poor out of the dust, and he lifted the needy out of the dunghill. You can be on this side of the tracks, and as Doris used to say, be poor as Job's turkey. I guess Job had a skinny turkey. I don't know where that phrase came from. Poor as Job's turkey. You'd be over here. Some of us have been there. We had Ryan. I told you a few weeks ago, we had Ryan. A little while later, a little while after that, we had a bag of beans and baby food in our apartment. That's all we had. We had nothing. We were in college. We had, I had been laid off from my job. They wouldn't give me, they said, you can't get unemployment because you're not available 24 hours a day. We had nothing. Nothing. A bag of beans. Couldn't feed a baby beans. We went to church that day, and our Sunday school class was about 90 people, and they had a food shower for us, I told you a few weeks ago. The whole corner of the gymnasium was full of food, a stroller for Ryan. We had nothing. But we could have got on the phone, and Becky could have got on the phone and said, Dad, we need help. Guess what we would have had? Facts sent to us. Money. Instantly. But we didn't do that. The Lord knew. We didn't tell them. They didn't know. They knew I was out of a job. But the Lord provided food, diapers, a stroller for Ryan. The bigger the babies get, the heavier they get. You know, carry them. But the Lord took care of us. Why? We were poor. You can be on this side of the tracks and be the richest person. There's a little house up around the curb. A doctor lives there. Dr. Grossman. He's probably making as much money and retired as he was when he worked. He has that big building there, that clinic, and I'm sure every one of those doctors pay him rent, they pay him fees. He's making money off of that business. Huge house. They said the they said the attic in it held 90 people. They had a party when they opened it. The attic held 90 people and there was all kinds of room. Anyone else got a house that big? 90 people. Had a big party. If you want to get saved, God will take you too. No matter how rich you are, no matter how poor. His grace. It doesn't just go to one. It goes to all. The grace of His reaching down. It is implied in the very, in the, you know, in the verse that God, you know, how it was said. He reaches down to us. He's, he's got, think about it. We talked about this a few years ago. I read this thing and I thought about it. And here's God on this throne. He's up here and he's exalted. And we said when the, the New Jerusalem, 1,500 miles wide and half the size, half of that's for his throne. So 750 miles, he's up there being exalted. He would deserve, he deserves for every one of us to be prostrate in front of us. And, and that's all. That's all he deserves. But he takes the time. To touch us, we just prayed for Mike, we prayed for Sonny, we prayed for Larry and, Con Larry, Larry and Connie. Do you believe God's going to answer our prayers? Amen. Of course He will. He said He would. He promised He would. But He wouldn't have to do that. He could sit up there and be a big shot and say, "This, you owe me everything, I'm not doing a thing for you. Now as humans, there are human beings get to that point and they say that. But there's a thing called humility. And who's going to write the book? Humility and how I attained it. Here's how I did. I'm going to brag about it. 
No, that doesn't work. Humility. We serve the Lord. God sits up there, though. He has blessings for us. But even more amazing is the fact that, like we said, He would come down, and He would rescue somebody like us, when we didn't deserve a thing. I didn't deserve to be saved on December 3rd, 1972. I did not deserve it. None of you deserve to be saved. Whenever you got saved, whenever you became a Christian, whenever you invited him in your heart, you didn't deserve it. You hadn't done it. I don't care if you've gone to church. I don't care if your parents went to church. I don't care if your relatives went to church. My grandparents were Christians. They didn't, that didn't save me. My mom and dad went to church. That didn't save me. We have the grace of his raising up. He lifts up the needy. Now, I can't answer the question why some people are worse than others. I can't answer all those questions. But I don't care. We have several homeless people who live here in town, a lot of them downtown. Doesn't matter if you have a home. Doesn't matter if you have a job. Doesn't matter if you have a car. Doesn't matter if you don't have any of those. If you ask Jesus to come in your heart, he'll say you're welcome. Come on in. And I will come into your heart. He said, come into my house. Why? Because... We can't lift ourselves up. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous. How many? No, not one. Seven or eight billion people on this earth right now, and it says, of all these people God's looking down on, there's not one righteous. Not even one. Sodom and Gomorrah. God saw that city. They asked, well, if you just find ten, got down to ten, ten, if you find ten righteous people, will you save these cities? Of course. God couldn't you find ten righteous people in two cities. He destroyed them. Because there's none righteous, no, not one. That's why he came and died. Look at this next slide. He paid our price, and he will lift all who will believe him. He will lift them out of the dust of the earth, and he will. There's this word twice. W-I-L-L. -L. Doesn't say he might. He will set them in what kind of places? Wow. As humans, we don't want to put somebody else higher than us. Someone who always cuts other people down, who always has bad things to say, they believe that they're lower than them, and they're trying to pull people down. They're trying to pull people down to their level. That's according to the psychology class of the man. Um, they try to get everybody down their level. So we get down our level because we're sinners. We could be there too. We could feel like we're worthless. I told you I had a friend work with a guy who dad all his life told him he was worthless. You're just worthless. You're not worth anything. And he got saved and he started thinking about it. He said, you know what? I am worth something. I'm a child of God. And he changed his whole attitude. He changed Later in life, his dad and him became better friends. But, um, and his dad was mowing his grass one day. He was out there pushing the mower. His wife looked out there. He'd been remarried. He'd been remarried. His wife looked out there. He took a handkerchief out of his pocket. He wiped his forehead. Fell over, had a heart attack, fell over dead. Larry just said that. We don't know we're going to come, come to church again. None of us do. Larry was glad to come in here Wednesday night. This, this is his family. He fell over dead. But his dad told him, he said, you're worthless. He said, I am worth something. I'm a child of God. You can't get any higher than that. You can't get any better than that. Then, look at the next one here, because of his Greatness, praise Him. He cancels out our past. He cancels out our past. Everyone may have people who knew what you were before you were saved. In college, they told us, they encouraged us, most of our professors had been pastors, and they said, if you, unless the Lord impl implicitly tells you to go back to your hometown, they, they implored us not to do that because they said there are people there, there are other people who tried that, and they're never successful because there are people there and they knew who you were before you were saved. If I ask you to raise your hand 
Raise your hand if you did something before you're saved you wish you had never done and you, you don't do it again. Yeah. And your siblings and your cousins and your aunts and your neighbors, they all saw it. And, every, and they all remember it. They don't remember the good things you did. They don't remember that you helped a little old lady cross the street. They don't remember that you helped the neighbors that you mowed the grass. They don't remember any of that. All they remember, everybody in the neighborhood knows who you were. Well, Becky's brother went in the Navy, and he was a candidate for to be a Navy SEAL. The FBI came around their neighborhood and talked to everybody. They talked to everybody. He ultimately, eventually, was a Navy SEAL. Still can't talk about some of the stuff he did. He's on the underwater demolition team. But they came and talked to everybody. People, no doubt, told him that he did some things here and some things there. But apparently it wasn't bad enough to not be a Navy SEAL. Those of you have been around well, you knew my father-in-law. He didn't put up with shenanigans when he raised his kids. Um, but they talked to everybody. I'm sure everybody had things to say. What would your old neighbor's friends, cousins say about you if, they, if somebody asked about you your past? They all, probably have all kinds of things to say, but then you get up here in front of the throne of God, and he takes this pass, and he has this big eraser. And he takes this eraser, and he marks it all off, what you did in the past. And he takes this stamp, <clears throat> like you've done if you paid your mortgage off, if you paid a home off, a car, alone. He takes this stamp and says paid in full in red letters and he takes it. Pow! I hit the pulpit but it hurt my hand. This arthritis isn't no fun. Um, he pounded on that paper and it would say Richard Borden sins paid in full and nothing underneath it. Frank Medley, sins, paid in full. Jim Nykert, I know you're hard to believe, but sins, paid in full. <laughs> Every one of us, paid. What did we do to deserve it? Absolutely nothing. He takes the worst of humanity and he blesses them. He took Gideon from the threshing floor and from following the donkeys and he said David from the leading them people leading the people he sent the apostles he took them from fishing and from the deadness of sin he said I'll make you fishers of men every one of us he pulled us out of the miry clay we we're all headed for hell and from what I read in the Bible Hell is not going to be a very pleasant place. But he, he takes and he picks us up. He lifts us up. What did Larry say a while ago? You get down, you get, this, you get discouraged, you get low, you, you don't know if you're going to make it. Last year he didn't know if when he had the heart attack, he didn't know if he was going to make it then. But God had a purpose for him. He wants him to aggravate joys. And Joyce had a great letter. And we were talk about when they talk about that, I thought about our caregivers. They have an awesome job too. We pray for them. We've got them on our prayer list. We pray for our caregivers. But God lifts us up. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Under good works, meaning for him, which God, listen to this, he hath before ordained. That we should walk in them. He had a plan. His workmanship. I've made things out of clay. I've made things out of wood. I've made things out of paper. I've taken this and this and this and added in a pot and make soup. Make all kinds of things. I'm trying to give Mike and Linda some meals. In a week or two, and Mike's not dead yet, so I guess the food's okay. 
I truly appreciate it. Yeah. But you can make things, all kinds of things, but I can't make what God does. And we're proud of what we do. Jim has made all kinds of things with wood. Larry's made all kinds of things. They've done all kinds of things, but nothing compares to what God does with his hands. He's a potter, we're the clay. And he doesn't lift us out halfway. He finishes the job. When I was saved, I was changed 100%. Rush Limbaugh used to aggravate people that didn't like him because he said he could, he could take them on with 99.9% .9 of his brain tied behind his back. People just hated that. He did it. He, he, he aggravated them, so the more they got aggravated, the more he did it. You know how that happens. God picked me up 100%. When you got saved, he took you up 100%. He doesn't go part of the way. We, at 20 till yesterday, quarter till yesterday, quarter two, Connor kept saying it's 20 till. We get to go home. 15 minutes, we get to go home. 10 minutes, we get to go home. They didn't kind of work. They helped. They, they filled that truck and trailer and unloaded that truck and trailer. We had them carrying things yesterday. They were the youngest one here. They had the muscle. They had all the muscle. We were using them. Francis would call them. Karen would call them. I'd tell them. They were helping people. I think they both slept good last night. They worked and worked to work. Karen said she was up late. They do for stuff, some stuff for mom. She should have slept good as, as much as she worked. And you don't wear a Fitbit, do you, Karen? You, you probably walked 20,000 20, steps yesterday. So lastly, this is a thing that we all have to have. He conquers our problems. Psalm 113, verse 9 says, He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. And says, Praise ye the Lord. It doesn't matter what your situation, if you will trust him, he will give you joy. And everything isn't always hunky-dory, is it? Everything's not perfect. There are several in this building that have physical issues, but they go on. I only have half vision out of one eye. I could quit, but we go on. He maketh us to go. Here is the image of the, the childless woman to illustrate despair and distress. And we, I'm obviously not a female. But I have lived with one for almost a few weeks, a couple weeks, August 5th, to be 44 years. Now, somebody tried to write a book on how to understand women and never did figure it out. I know it goes both ways, how to understand men. But God made women emotional. He made them that way. Most women desire to have children. Some God doesn't allow that to happen for some reason, whatever it is. We talk about our professors and colleagues, the deals. They've been on furlough and they were in Zaire. They never had children, but it, while they were in Zaire and Congo, they planted 150 churches. When Dr. When Brother Deal died a couple years ago, he said all those churches were still going. But God didn't want them to have kids. God didn't desire for them to have children, but they had planted 150 churches, and they're still preaching the Word of God, and in, in Congo and Zaire, wherever it is now, there are people getting saved. So he has a plan for all of us. But the bare woman, she wanted to have children. But she still had joy. So what does that mean to us this morning? Real quickly, he can take the bareness of our lives, like this woman. It's caused by sin, of course, but he can take that. And he can bring forth fruit. And it's for his victory. Job 15, 5 says, I am the vine... You are the branches. I mean, John. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth, you know what that next two words say? Much fruit. Not just fruit, 
we're hooked on to Jesus. And we produce fruit. There are all kinds of fruit that we put in our bodies. There are green grapes, there are red grapes, there are black grapes, there's watermelon, there's honeydew, there's all, you know, you get it, there's, there's kiwi, there's all kinds of stuff. Peaches and pears and all kinds of fruit that we, that God made for us. And those plants produce that fruit. Many of, many of you have probably picked apples off the tree and ate it right there. The best thing is a nice, fresh tomato. Nice, fresh tomato right off the vine. A little bit of salt. Boy, that's good stuff. I like tomatoes. Did you figure that out? Uh, my dad always liked watermelon tomatoes, and I, the same thing, and mustard, so do I. Um, but a life without God, it's empty. It's barren like this woman, but a life touched by God, it's fruitful. And as we said about God, it's glorious. His glory, His grace, and His goodness make Him worthy of praise. And then lastly, one day, when he comes back, when he's done, when the last person's saved, the trumpet's going to sound, we're going to hear this trumpet. We hear fire trucks every morning. Every morning in our house, we hear fire trucks. Fire trucks. Because we live across the street from fire station. Um, parking lot's across from us. Buildings up here, most of you know, you, you drive by our house and look at it, see how the flowers are. There's two apartment buildings next door. And there was a fireman several years ago, his name was Rusty. And he must have worked night for whatever. And they got on that horn, they got on the speaker on that fire truck one morning. And they said, hey Rusty, it's time to get up. <laughs> the whole neighborhood heard it. I'm sure Rusty heard it. But every morning they come out and sound off. They have to they bring all three fire trucks out. They have to check the sirens. They have to set the, the horn. They check the lights. They have different Monday morning they check certain things. Tuesday morning they check certain things. Wednesdays they check certain things. They have 20 fire shifts. Work from 7 to 7. The new guys come in. They check everything out. Because when uh, when they get called, you know, when Connor's been outside, every time they've outside, Two fire trucks just left, the ambulance has left twice, and another fire truck's coming back in. He's watching, you know, kids are fascinated by it. We don't care, we hear it all the time, we've heard it for 33 years, doesn't bother us till we hear the beep and the backup beeper, and that's the only time we ever, sometimes we don't know when to leave, because they're going to the sirens up the street. But they have to sound off. And we can hear it. I always tell Becky, the fire trucks are whistling at her. One of these days, there's going to be a trumpet. It's going to sound off. If it happens today, you'll hear it even though you're in here. This is a drop ceiling. There's about this much room. There's another ceiling, cell attacks. There's insulation up there because Mike and I have been up there in the attic. And then there's the, the, the roof and then two the layer shingles. The doors, the windows. When God sounds that trumpet, we're going to hear it. We're going to hear that trumpet. And we're going to be gone. If you're here, you're going to go through the roof. If you're outside, you're going to hear your car, you're going to go through the roof. If you're home, you're going to go through the roof. If you're under the trees, you're going to go through the trees. When the trumpet sounds, we're gone. And then we get to look at his throne. We get to bow down in front of his throne. And we get to praise him. For seven years, there's a merry supper of the Lamb. We get to praise him for seven years. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And for eternity. When we finish this series, the last <coughs> is going to be eternal worship. For eternity, we get to praise and worship Him. The world has all these false gods. They'll, they're going to get melted down. They're going to get burned. They're going to get destroyed when the world's destroyed. The greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world. We get to live for eternity. Let's stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. And if you can come and just play, just play a song. Play 375 just as I am. We're not going to sing, but we're just going to have music. As heads bowed and eyes are closed, we get to praise the Lord forever. Why, are we, why should we praise Him? We just gave you a bunch of reasons. 
It's just the tip of the iceberg. But He's glorious. Maybe there's somebody here right now and you've never been asked Jesus to come in your heart with heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you'd like to step out and come up and somebody can show you how to be saved. You can do it right where you are. You can ask the Lord Jesus. If you're watching by video, you can say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I'm a sinner. I have failed you. Come into my heart and save me. And save me completely. Make me a new person. You can do it right now. Just as I am. He will take you just as you are. You can't be too bad for God. Praise Him? Of course He deserves the praise. Do we give Him enough? Most likely not. So Heavenly Father, we're going to ask You to touch our lives, bless our lives, use us, glorify us. We're going to publicly praise You right now. And thank You for what You are, who You are, how You are, where You are, what You've done for us, what You have promised for us. Thank You, thank You, thank You for sending Your Son. Bless our Sunday school hour as we are taught Your Word. Use us through this week, Lord. Plant somebody in front of us that we can be a minute that we can minister to, that we can be a blessing to, to show others that we're born again, that we're Christians, that we're different. Use us in a mighty way, and all God's people said.